Thank you. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Vera Hobhouse. Number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know that members across the whole House will wish to join me in offering our deepest condolences to the family and friends of Michael Martin, latterly Lord Martin of Springburn, who died earlier this week. He served as Speaker for nearly nine years, and I am sure members will remember his sense of public service, his commitment to his constituency in Glasgow, and his good humour. And I particularly remember him for the courtesy which he always showed me. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Vera Hobhouse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Upskirting is the vile practice of taking a photo under a woman's skirt without her consent. This is neither a specific nor sexual offence under the current law in England and Wales. I have been working closely with Gina Martin, who has been campaigning to change this for months, and her lawyer, to produce a private member's bill to make um, upskirting a specific crime under the Sexual Offences Act 2003. Both of us have joined us here today. Mr Speaker, I ask the Prime Minister, does she agree with us that the law in England and Wales should be reformed so that in all circumstances women like Gina and indeed the Honourable Lady herself will be protected from upskirt images being taken without consent? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first of all say to the Honourable Lady that I share the outrage at this intrusive behaviour uh, that, uh, that she has referred to and the distress that it can cause to victims. We are determined to ensure that victims do have confidence that their complaints will be taken seriously. It is possible currently to bring prosecutions, but my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, is examining the state of the law at the moment to make sure that it is fit for purpose, and as part of that work, he is considering her bill in detail. Raymond Chishti. Thank you, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Medway has recently been shortlisted to receive £170 million from the government's Housing Infrastructure Fund, which will help build and support 12,000 houses locally, having also benefited from the £6 billion government lower Thames crossing. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this demonstrates the government's commitment to supporting local communities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to my honourable friends that we do absolutely share his concern about ensuring that we are supporting local communities uh, and that we are delivering better infrastructure in those communities and maximising the potential of our country. And the Housing Infrastructure Fund is an important part of that. We need to build more homes across this country, but we also need to ensure the infrastructure is there to support those homes and help those local communities. That is exactly what we are doing. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to Michael Martin, former Labour MP for Glasgow Springburn and later Speaker of the House. He worked in the engineering industry in Glasgow. He was active in the then AUEW, and he and I first met when we were fellow organisers in the National Union of Public Employees in the 1970s, campaigning for decent public sector pay and a national minimum wage. Michael loved the community he represented, loved his family, and our deepest thoughts and sympathies go to him and his family at this present time. <laughs> Mr Speaker, did the Prime Minister feel the slightest pang of guilt when the Home Secretary was forced to resign due to the failures of her predecessor? Can I say to uh, the right honourable gentleman that I think it might be helpful if I first update the House on the actions the government has taken in, and is continuing to take in relation to the Windrush in relation in relation to the Windrush in relation to the Windrush generation. Because my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will be addressing the House on this later today. We all share the ambition to make sure we do right by members of the Windrush generation, and that's why he will be announcing a package of measures to bring transparency on the issue, to inform, make sure that the House is informed, to reassure members of this House, but more importantly, to reassure those people who have been directly affected. Speed is of the essence, and my right honourable friend will be commissioning a full review of lessons learned, independent oversight, and external challenge with the intention of reporting back to this House before we rise for the summer. And the review will have full access to all relevant information in the Home Office, including policy papers and casework decisions. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, this was a crisis made in the Home Office by successive Home Secretaries. And last only a week ago, only a week ago today, 
the member for Hastings and Rye, then Home Secretary, was denying there were any targets in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee. On Monday, the Prime Minister told the media, when I was Home Secretary, yes, there were targets. One wonders why the Prime Minister didn't tell her Home Secretary about that. And the pain that's been caused to the Windrush generation needs to be resolved very rapidly and full compensation paid as quickly as it can be possibly done and an understanding of the hurt that they feel. But this isn't the only failure of this government or the only failure of its policies. The government used to talk about a long-term economic plan. But, but now... Now, Mr Speaker, we're the slowest growing economy in the G7. The Chancellor, sitting two places along from her, told, her, it told the House his view was positively tiggerish of, of the British economy. Yet it has the worst economic growth figures for five years. What plans does the Government have to change course to ensure we do get economic growth? First of all, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, can I say to the right honourable gentleman on the Windrush generation, I was Home Secretary when some of these decisions were taken uh, and mistakes were made about individual cases, and I've apologised for that. The former Home Secretary also apologised for that. The right honourable gentleman is right in saying this is, these are decisions that have been taken under successive Home Secretaries, including under the last Labour government. And when he, if he wants to talk. If he wants to talk about the economy, let's just see what we've seen in our economy in recent weeks. Day-to-day spending in surplus for the first time in 16 years. The lowest net borrowing in over a decade. Exports of goods and services at a record high. Employment at a record high. And real wages up. That's a Conservative government delivering an economy fit for the future. Mr Speaker, four facts about the economy. More, Mr Speaker, more people in debt, more people using food banks, more people sleeping on our streets and more children in poverty. And the consequences of decisions made by the Chancellor of the Exchequer are that the NHS is suffering the longest funding squeeze in history. It sent our health service into an all-year-round crisis. Will the Prime Minister apologise to NHS patients waiting longer than ever for the worst A&E waiting times on record? I gave the right honourable gentleman some facts about the economy. I can give him some others. More people in work and actually fewer, fewer children in absolute poverty under this government. And when it comes to the National Health Service, since November, the cha- my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, has announced £10 billion extra for the National Health Service. But I have also said that we want to ensure that the National Health Service is able to operate on a long-term plan. That is why we are conducting a review to produce that long-term plan with sustainable multi-year funding. That is the sensible approach to take, not just to say this is all about money, but to say how can we ensure that the NHS is the NHS that will deliver for people in the future. That is about funding. It is also about reform in the NHS to make sure patients get the right treatment. Mr Speaker, not only was March the worst month on record in A&E departments, it was also the worst month for cancelled operations. There are 100,000 vacancies for NHS staff, and the Prime Minister personally intervened to overrule the Health Secretary and the Home Secretary when they asked for a relaxation of visa rules in order to recruit staff to work in our NHS. But it's not just the NHS where the Government is damaging our public services. In January, the Education Secretary promised that no school would see a cut in its funding. Last week, he was invited to repeat that pledge and refused. I wonder why. Will the Prime Minister now tell parents, teachers and students the truth, 
that the school's budget is in fact being cut in real terms all over the country. The, the right honourable gentleman is wrong. What we are doing is ensuring that there is more money available to, uh, to schools. We are ensuring that we are protecting that core budget because we want to ensure that every child, regardless of the background, gets the education that they need and the education that fulfils their potential. And that's why, once again, it's not just a question of the money you put in, it's about how you spend the money you are spending. And that's why I'm pleased to say that 1.9 million more children are in good or outstanding schools under this government, and education standards are going up under this government. That's more opportunities for our young people. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it is quite astonishing that the Education Secretary has been corrected by the UK Statistics Authority. The IFS says that schools' budgets are being cut, and the Prime Minister still appears to be in denial. It is not just in NHS and education where this government is damaging our public services. Mr Speaker, it is also about police budgets. The previous Home Secretary claimed there was no link between police numbers and serious violent crime, yet Home Office civil servants said there is a link. Who does the Prime Minister think is right? I say, first of all, on the issue of, uh, of crime and police budgets, of course, we are making available this year four hundred and fifty million more pounds for police forces across the country. We have been protecting uh, police budgets, which is in direct contrast to what I was uh, what I was suggested to me I should do by the former Shadow Home ah. Secretary, the former Labour member, now the uh, Mayor for Manchester, when he suggested five to ten percent cuts could be given in uh, in police budgets. But can I also say to the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman that he talks about the issue of uh, numbers and the relationship between police numbers and crime. His own shadow police minister has said in terms that there isn't that relationship between police funding and the number of crimes that take place. Once again, it is how we ensure we are dealing with these issues. It is ensuring that the police are able to deal with the challenges and crimes of today, and that is what we are doing with our serious violence strategy, with our national crime agency, taking action across the board to ensure that our police are able to keep people safe. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, our Shadow Police Minister was pointing out that there has been a £2.3 billion cut in police budgets in the last Parliament, and it is her government that is underfunding our police force. 21,000 police officers have lost their jobs since 2010. 6,700 police and community support officers lost their jobs. In the meantime, violent crime is rising, and sadly, there are deaths from knife crime on the streets of most cities, particularly in London. Mr Speaker, the economy is slowing, homelessness is rising, more children are living in poverty, the Home Office in chaos and the Government making a complete shambles of the Brexit negotiations. They are damaging our NHS, damaging our children's schools, cutting police as crime scores. And, Mr Speaker, they claim and, Mr Speaker, they claim to be strong and stable. With council tax rising by more than 5 per cent all over the country, isn't the truth? The truth, Mr Speaker, facing voters tomorrow, is that with the Tories, you pay more and you get less. funding going into the NHS, more funding going into our schools, more funding going into social care. But if he wants to, he wants, he wants to talk about council tax and the impact of council tax on local residents, well, I suggest he goes to Hazelbourne Road in Clapham. On one side of the road, in a typical home, someone will pay nearly £1,400 in council tax. Now, that, of course, is in Labour-run Lambeth. On the other side of the road, someone in a typical home will pay just over £700 in council tax. That 
votes in Conservative run Wandsworth. No clearer, no clearer example can there be that Conservative councils cost you less. Mr. Peter Boone. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 331 days, 11 hours, 40 minutes, and 22 seconds, the Prime Minister will be leading us out of the European Union. She will end the free movement of the people. We will stop sending billions of pounds each and every year to the EU, and we'll make our own laws in our own country, judged by our own judges. My question to the Prime Minister is: In 332 days' time. Will she come to Wellingborough, where she will be carried shoulder high through the streets to the echoing of cheering crowds, and I will be able to show her the site where a statue to the Brexit Queen will be erected? Can I say to uh, can I? I'm tempted. Order. I don't, order. I don't think we. I don't think we were in any danger of not hearing the question, but we must hear the answer. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend is absolutely right. We will be leaving the European Union, and I'm tempted to say to his request, "How can I refuse?" <laughs> Mr. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A young mother in Courtbridge, a grandmother who has lived here for 50 years. A former cook in this parliament, just three examples of people who have been wrongly told to leave the United Kingdom. Then there are numerous people wrongly detained or deported, lives turned upside down, irreparable damage to families. The Prime Minister on the 22nd of October 2013 in this chamber said, deport first and hear appeals later. Will she now withdraw these remarks? say to the right honourable gentleman, he was referring to changes in legislation that were put through in the, uh, in the Immigration Act that followed that uh, particular debate. But can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he is right that, and I have apologised for not just the anxiety that has been caused to people in the Windrush ge- generation, but for those who have found themselves with decisions being taken about their situation here which were wrong, because the Windrush generation are British and they are part of us. That is why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is making sure that the the task force that has been put in place, the team that has been put in place, is dealing with cases expeditiously and is giving people the reassurance about their status here. But I also say to the right honourable gentleman that we do need to ensure that we are a welcoming country for people who want to come here and contribute, but that we also take action against those who are illegally here, who break the rules and who try to play the system. Ian Blackford. Well, interestingly, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister failed to remove these insulting remarks. And let me say, it's easy to change your Secretary of State. She does it frequently. <laughs> you need to change your policies. Currently, there are an estimated 120,000 undocumented children who are entitled by law to the UK citizenship, but only if they register at a cost of £1,000. A new Windrush generation who will be unable to secure jobs and rent properties. These children, entitled to citizenship, they should not be charged to exercise their rights. How can she possibly justify these policies? To the right honourable gentleman, I think what members of the public want to ensure is that we have a fair immigration system, that we have rules, that we re- with, uh, um, people abide by those rules, and that's why we make a very clear distinction between people who have come here. I want people who come here legally, who do the right thing, who contribute to our society, to, to be able to feel this is a welcoming country and one of the most welcoming countries in the world. On the other side, we also need to make sure that we uh, have a system that deals with those who break the rules, who play the system and who try to jump ahead of others. And that's what people will expect for us. They want us to have a system which they want us to have a system which is fair and a system which sets out rules and uh, ensure that people are abiding by them. Mrs. Kimmy Badenoch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, 
Mr Speaker. Carver Barracks in my constituency of Saffron Walden is home to the Royal Engineers Bomb Disposal Unit, who carry out life-saving but very dangerous work on all our behalves. Can the Prime Minister tell the House what the Government's veteran strategy is and how it will help soldiers such as those at Carver Barracks in their transition to civilian life? Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, we very, very much value uh, the work that is done by the Explosive Ordnance Disposable uh, Unit of uh, 33 and 101 engineer regiments. It is this gra- uh, veteran strategy, which was recently launched by my right honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, is a groundbreaking strategy. There will be a government task force from across the whole of Whitehall, from across departments, and it will be focusing on exactly the sort of issues she's made, which is assessing how we can help veterans meet the financial demands of civilian life, crucially ensuring that mental and physical well-being is maximised, and offering the best possible advice to veterans on, uh, on housing. I think this, these are the key issues for those veterans, and it's exactly what we'll be focusing on in this veteran strategy. Martin Doherty Hughes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Evidence of the inhumane and cruel impact of the government's flagship universal credit policy is clear for all to see. Its impact has been devastating, and the Prime Minister can no longer bury their head in the sand, as they have done with the Windrush scandal. Therefore, Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister get a grip, take action to protect families from being further forced further into crisis, or does the Prime Minister simply believe that the damage being done to the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities is a price worth paying. Yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman, we have been rolling out universal credit. We have been doing it at a pace which ensures we have been able to hear from those who have been affected by it and to make changes. And changes have been made in the way that universal credit is, uh, is introduced in this country. We have ensured that we have reduced that, so taken out that seven days uh, of waiting time, for example. But what lies behind universal credit is the belief that actually the important thing for families to help sustain them is to get people into work. The evidence of universal credit is it is doing just that. It is helping people into work. And I would have thought the honourable gentleman should welcome a policy that helps people to get into the workplace. John Stevenson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister indicated that she was minded to visit my constituency of Carlisle. I'm delighted to inform the Prime Minister that from the 4th of June, she will be able to fly into Carlisle on a commercial flight for the first time in 30 years. She will arrive in the city which is at the centre of the United Kingdom and a city recently described as the beating heart of the uh, Borderlands region. But if Carlisle and the Borderlands are to succeed, thrive and grow, we need government support. (coughs) Can the Prime Minister confirm that she will give the Borderlands such support? Can I I first of all join my honourable friend in uh, welcoming the return of commercial flights to Carlisle Airport? This will allow more people to access the Borderlands region. But can I also, he says, he talks about support for the Borderlands. Of course, the Borderlands growth deal, which my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, committed to, is an important part of that. And I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend on his recent appointment as Borderlands growth deal champion. I'm sure he will be doing all he can to ensure that that government support is there and that the Borderlands. Borderlands continue to thrive. How, William? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has said many, many times that she'll have no hard border between Dublin and Belfast. Can she tell this House just once what sort of a border she'd like to see between Uh, Dublin and Holyhead? Can I say to the honourable gentleman that we have been very clear? that we will not see a border down the Irish Sea. We have been clear about that in the joint report that was issued between us and the European Commission and adopted by the European Council in December. And when the European Commission made a proposal for dealing with the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, which would have meant a border down the Irish Sea, I was clear that neither I nor any British Prime Minister could accept that. Matt Warman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With a rising budget and a new medical school for Lincolnshire, this government has very clearly demonstrated its commitment to the NHS in Boston and Skegness. But there are short-term challenges recruiting paediatric staff to the paediatric ward. Can my right honourable friend reassure my constituents and parents in my constituency that the decision to make a temporary closure has not yet been made 
and that she will work with me to leave no stone unturned so that Trust, NHS England and NHS Improvement can work together to make sure that we recruit the doctors we need and this government is investing in. Can I, can I give my re- uh, uh, honourable friend the reassurance that he is asking for? He's right that we're supporting the NHS in Boston and Skegness. Any decision taken by the Trust about the services available will of course be made to ensure that the provision of services is safe for patients. The Trust is continuing to try and recruit paediatricians to support the service. It wants to continue to provide paediatric services at Boston, and every effort will be made to ensure that that can continue. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Windrush scandal is not a mistake, nor is it an aberration. It is the direct result of the Prime Minister's policies. Unobtainable net migration targets and the hostile environment are the Prime Minister's policies. So will she take this opportunity to make a public apology to people who have been... Will she make a public apology to people... Will she make a public apology for her policies? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can, I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that uh, she might have listened to the answer that I gave earlier in, the, uh, in Prime Minister's questions. She might also have listened. She might also have listened to the uh, answers that I gave last week, and I was very clear in my apology to those of the Windrush generation who have been caught up in this issue. She talks about what has happened here. What has happened here is that people who are here legally, who are British, have found themselves caught up in this, and as I've said, I apologise for that. What has also happened is that over the years, governments of both Labour, Coalition and Conservative governments have successively been taking action to deal with illegal immigrants, which is a different issue. This is an issue that has been dealt with by governments of all colours. Amber Rudd. Opportunity to congratulate my right honourable friend for Bromsgrove on his appointment yeah. to the yeah. Such an important department, not only in terms of security, but also in terms of ensuring we have a safe and fair immigration policy. Yeah. Yeah. Could, I, could I add, Mr. Speaker, that the UK threat level remains at severe? Uh. Last year we had five terrorist attacks that got through and 36 innocent people that were killed. Could I invite the Prime Minister to share with me our our admiration for the extraordinary work and bravery that is done by our counter-terrorism for policing, our emergency services and our security services, which I know we are all grateful for. Can I, I, uh, first of all, say to my right honourable friend that I am pleased to be able to have this opportunity to pay tribute to her and the work that she did as Home Secretary. She worked... she, She... She did valuable work across all elements of the Home Office, uh, including issues like modern slavery and domestic violence. The work my right honourable friend did with the internet companies in terms of keeping people safe on the internet was groundbreaking. And can I also share with her the support and admiration for the work that all in our emergency services, in our police, in our counter-terrorism police and in our security and uh, intelligence agencies do for all that they do to keep us safe and also commend her for the work that she did following the terrorist attacks last year to set in train action to ensure that we continue to make sure that those services get the support they need to be able to continue to keep us safe. Joe Stevens. Thank Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's new Home Secretary says that her hostile environment, and I quote, does not represent our values as a country. Does she agree with him? What the right honourable, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary said, was that he absolutely shares the need to differentiate between legal and illegal immigrants. What he also said, what he also said, was that there was a certain phrase that he wasn't going to use, a phrase that was first used by Labour ministers in government. Across government, we are clear that we are working hard to support and to help those of the Windrush generation who have been caught up in this issue recently uh, uh, across time, but also that we are ensuring that we do have a fair immigration policy that does ensure 
that those people who break the rules, who play the system, who try to jump ahead of others, are not able to carry on being here in this country in the same way as those who play by the rules and who are hard-working taxpayers and contribute to our society. And that's only fair. Helen Grant. Does my right hon. Friend uh, agree with me that it is only under the Conservatives that you get decision and that you get vision? And that is why Maidstone Borough Council needs to turn blue on the 3rd of May. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I say to my hon. Friend that she is absolutely right? If you look up and down the country, and those who are taking part in uh, council elections tomorrow who are making those decisions, they will see that up and down the country it is Conservative councils that support local communities, provide good local services and keep council tax low. And the message is very clear. If that is what you want, vote Conservative tomorrow. Ms Karen Buck. Mr Speaker, yeah. Ministers yeah. will today discuss the two customs arrangement proposals first put forward last August. The first is untried and untested. The second relies on unproven and technology. In any event, neither will be ready in time that they are needed, and both have been written off in Europe. Why, with just six months to go before a draft Brexit deal is signed off, yeah. are the government still considering yeah. options that we all know are not feasible? Yeah. 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 Can I say to the Honourable Lady that we're very clear. We're going to leave the uh, European Union on the 29th of March 2019. We will be leaving. We will be leaving the customs union. We want to ensure that we can have an independent trade policy. We also want to ensure that we actually uh, we deliver. We are committed to delivering on our commitment of no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and ensuring we have as frictionless trade as possible with the European Union. There are a number of ways in which that can be delivered, and uh, there are a number of ways in which that can be delivered. And if she's so interested, if she's so interested in the whole question of customs border, she might like to ask her front bench to actually come to a decision on what the Labour Party policy is on this. Sir William Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, European, the European Scrutiny Committee, of which I have the honour to chair, uh, has invited Mr. Ollie Robbins to appear before the committee on several occasions since February. So far, this has not been arranged. Would my right honourable friend be good enough to use her charm to ensure that Mr. Robbins does appear, as has already the, Lord, the Chancellor himself and the Secretary of State for Exiting the Union and uh, Sir Tim Barrow? Well, can I say to my honourable friend, as he will know, um, that the, it, it isn't normally the case that any request to a civil servant to appear before a committee is automatically accepted. Decisions are taken about uh, at what level civil servants should appear before committees. He, as he said, he's had a number of my right honourable friends appearing before his committee. I remember uh, with, I'm, I'm not sure I can say fond memory, the time before when I appeared before the European Scrutiny Committee when I was Home Secretary, uh, but I will certainly look at the requests that he's made. Paula Sherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The interim report of the Mental Health Act review stated that BAME men and women are more likely to come into contact with mental health services through the police, to be admitted to secure hospitals and to have poorer mental health outcomes over time. The Prime Minister has talked about ending the burning injustice of mental ill health. So why has her government still not appointed an equalities champion to tackle these inequalities nearly two years after it was recommended by the five year forward view for mental health. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that it is precisely to identify this sort of disparity in public services that I launched the race disparity audit when I became Prime Minister. Now that does make in some areas that makes uncomfortable reading for our society, but it's absolutely right that we've done it and it's absolutely right that we then address the issues that it has raised. But she talks about the issue of the interaction of people with with mental health problems and the police. This isn't something that I waited to do something about until the race disparity audit. I did something about it when I was Home Secretary. We have significantly reduced the number of people with mental health problems who are being taken to a uh, cell in a police station as a place of refuge. We have ensured that there is health support available for the police. As a result of that, those people who are in mental health crisis are getting better treatment than they did previously. There's more to do, but we've already started to take action. Simon Hall. Yeah. 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 
the, the hopes of the 464 survivors of thalidomide in the United Kingdom, the Thalidomide Trust and the all-party group which I chair, were significantly depressed at the weekend seeing media coverage, particularly in the Sunday Times, suggesting that the German government is seeking to resile from its verbal pledge to make good the promise to compensate those UK survivors whose parents, whose mothers, took and were prescribed the German manufactured drug thalidomide. Their lives are shortening and they need support. Will my right honourable friend use her good offices to augment the work of the Foreign Office to make the case for UK thalidomide survivors to the German government to finally get the justice that they have for too long been denied? Can I say to my honourable friend, I fully recognise why uh, those people who are the survivors of the Lidabide are were so concerned at the reports that they saw, because, of course, although back in 2012 the Department of Health here has announced uh, a, an £80 million grant for the Lidabide survivors, of course they have been able and are able to apply to the German uh, Contagan Foundation for Disabled Persons for funds. Uh, in re relation to the particular point he's raised, I know that my right honourable friend, the Minister for Europe, has met representatives of the Thalidomide Trust um, at the end, towards the end of last year to discuss this, and the FCO is remaining in contact with the Trust, and the FCO is pursuing their discussions with the German Government on this point. Helen Jones. When one of my constituents had a heart attack, he waited an hour and 20 minutes for a paramedic and two hours for an ambulance because they were having to queue up at local hospitals. He never made it back home. Faced with such a human tragedy, does the Prime Minister feel any pang of conscience for the shambles she has created in our NHS? Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that she sets out what is obviously a very sad and tragic case in relation to her constituent? I'm happy to look at the issues, at the background of what led to that particular uh, outcome being the result. We all want to make sure that patients are able to be treated in the NHS when they need that treatment and get the appropriate treatment. That's why, that's why we have been putting that extra money into the NHS, but as I say, it's a very sad, very sad case that she's outlined, and I'm happy to look at the details of it. I'm Cheryl Gillen. Speaker, as voters go to the polls tomorrow, could the Prime Minister confirm that a green future is at the heart of our local government policies? Yeah, yeah. And would she agree to meet with me and others to look at our aspiration for the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty to become a national park so we can increase the opportunities afforded for open air recreation on London's doorstep? Yeah. Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that we are protecting our natural environment and we want to leave a cleaner, greener Britain for our children, and that's not just a, uh, something that Conservatives in national government want to do, it's what Conservatives at local government want to do as well. Um, that's why we've launched our 25 year environment plan. I, uh, I know the beauty of the Chilterns, I enjoy working in the Chilterns, and uh, I'm happy to meet my right honourable friend and others to discuss her proposal. Chris Stevens! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister confirm that every UK government department has budgeted for a derisory 1% pay rise for all of its civil servants? Mm. Is it fair that workers who collect tax try to make a broken social security system work and a broken immigration system work are getting a real terms pay cut and still subjected to a public sector pay cap? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I say to the honourable gentleman that, as he knows, we have been very clear uh, that, the, uh, uh, in terms of the 1%, uh, cap that has taken place over recent years on the public sector pay. Uh, we have been clear that the, that blanket cap is not an approach that we are taking in the future. Obviously, departments are funded at a certain level, and it's for departments then to come forward with their proposals in relation to pay within their department. Jones. Uh, yes. Today, council tax on average cost less in real terms than it did in 2010. Yeah. Under 13 years of Labour in government, council tax doubled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Will my right honourable friend confirm that the council tax referendum principles that this government's put in place have been a resounding success? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can 
I say to my honourable friend, he is absolutely right uh, about the facts that he has set out in relation to council tax. That is a result of decisions that have been taken by the government to have that council tax referendum in place and uh, decisions that where we see Conservative councils actually making decisions to freeze or to lower council tax or to ensure that it is kept uh, lower than the Labour councils. Conservative councils, on average, cost a, a typical family £100 less in council tax than councils run by other parties. That is important, and the Government has played its part with the council tax referendum. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, since being first elected in 2015, I have consistently campaigned to protect hundreds of jobs at risk in Dundee from being lost through HMRC's shoddy restructuring. I was finally given a written guarantee that these jobs would be transferred to the DWP. However, I have since learnt, without explanation, that this is no longer to be the case. So will the Prime Minister personally intervene to reverse this reckless U-turn and betrayal by taking charge to save each and every one of the 479 highly skilled jobs without which will leave a devastating impact on the staff, their families and my city. Yeah. Can I say to the uh, honourable gentleman that he's raised an issue. I have not seen the details of that issue, but I will ensure that my right honourable friends, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Secretary of State for uh, Work and Pensions, look at the issue he's raised. Yeah. Nikki Morgan. Yeah, Thank you, yeah. Mr Speaker. This afternoon, the Treasury Select Committee will take evidence from TSB about the recent IT failures, sure. which have left thousands of customers unable to access their accounts, yeah. unable to uh, pay their bills, Shocking. and with some very severe consequences. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree that a robust and reliable banking IT infrastructure is essential in the modern economy. Yeah, yeah. It's unfair to businesses who can't pay their takings. It's unfair to vulnerable customers, yeah, and it's particularly unfair when many banks are still closing branches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that I agree that obviously in today's world of modern banking, a robust and safe and reliable IT system is uh, an essential underpinning of that modern banking. And I'm sure that my right honourable friend and the Treasury Select Committee uh, will be ensuring that they get to the bottom of what has happened in TSB in the evidence that they take. Gloria De Piero. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, last Saturday night an 83-year-old woman had a fall at home and was, and was bleeding from a head wound. She waited for an ambulance for nearly three hours. Oh, no. Will the Prime Minister yes. apologise to my constituent and promise the rest of the country that no one else's elderly mum will suffer like this? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that if she would like to give details, uh, clear, uh, uh, more expansive details of the case, then I know that the Secretary of State will health will look very closely into what she has, into the case that she's identified. I'm, I'm sorry to hear of the circumstances of her, on, uh, her constituent, but we will look into the case. Of oh, Blackman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night at 9:08 p.m., two men were shot outside Queensbury Station on the edge of my constituency. One is dead; the other in a critical condition. Queensbury Station is a, an important transport hub for the people of, of Harrow East and also the people of Brent North. Will my right honourable friend join with me in thanking the police for their prompt action in securing the area, and equally the messages of reassurance they're giving to the community today? Will she also? Take every necessary step to remove guns and knives yes, from society yeah. to prevent reoccurrence. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, I recognise the importance that is attached to Queensbury Station. Can I also say I join him in commending uh, the action of the of police and emergency services in re response to these in and other such incidents. Uh, he's right in the importance of dealing with offensive weapons. That's why we've announced plans, announced uh, under my right honourable friend, the previous Home Secretary, being taken forward by the current Home Secretary to introduce an offensive weapons bill. It's why we have launched a serious violence strategy uh, and the the Serious Violence Task Force, which actually brings together ministers and representatives from across this House, uh, together with police and others, to deal with this issue, met for the first time, and it will continue to meet as it continues to address this important issue. Thank you. 